<clears throat> a very good morning to all of you. Uh, welcome to the second technical session of International Conference on Futuristic Materials. In today's session, we have a plenary talk followed by four invited talks from uh, different speakers. I am uh, thankful to Professor A.K. Gupta, Professor Anjan Kumar Gupta, sir, for uh, giving his uh, consent on uh, such a short notice and uh, other speakers as well. So, uh, to chair this session, I invite Professor R.S. Singh, sir, and uh, to co-chair this session, I invite Professor R.K. Tiwari, sir. Both are my senior colleagues from Department of Physics, Gorakhpur University. So I request uh, Professor R.S. Singh, sir, to conduct this session. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Amrish. May I welcome you all is morning session. It will be the first session in which a plenary talk by Professor Anjan Kumar Gupta from IIT Kanpur, Indian Institute of Technology Kanpur. The title of his plenary talk is Electronic in homogeneities in graphene and silicon dioxide due to interface charges. I welcome all my seniors, colleagues, junior colleagues, students who get joined in this international conference on futuristic materials to acquaint our plenary speaker i would like to just uh, present a brief biodata of professor anjan kumar gupta he has done his doctorate from Department of Physics and Astronomy, University of Kentucky, USA, and High TC Superconductor. His publications ranges from Nature Physical Review Letter, Europhysics Letters, Journal of Physics, Condensed Matter Physics, and many more. So, by his pub, and also one of his paper has appeared in science journals also. So we can we can see the top rated journal like Physical Review Letter, Science, Nature. He has co-authored with his collaborators. So his uh, <coughs> publication speaks a lot. I welcome Professor Anjan Kumar Gupta from the land of Mahayogi Gurshi Gorakshna Shodpit, that is Department of Physics, Deen De Alupadhyaya, Gorakhpur University, Gorakhpur. And uh, the time allotted uh, for him is almost about 30 minutes. I request Professor Anjan Kumar Gupta to complete his talk within 30 minutes and invite Professor Anjan Kumar Gupta to deliver his talk in today's, today's first session of the International Conference on Futuristic Materials. It has started from yesterday that is 18th december and it will conclude on 20th december 2020 so i invite professor anjan kumar gupta to kindly deliver his lecture professor anjan kumar gupta yes um thank you can you all hear me yes yes 
Okay. Um, and you can go see my screen also, right? Yes, yes. Please go ahead. Okay. I thank you, Professor Singh, for a nice introduction. And, and, and Dr. Srivastava for uh, inviting me to this um, conference. I, uh, uh, well, I, uh, well, my talk is on um, graphene, which is uh, definitely a very active research area. And uh, it, it focuses on um, certain, um, you know, certain aspects. Uh, I don't know if it really fits into the futuristic uh, materials um, uh, uh, that is the theme of the conference, but it's more about certain, um, you know, origin of electronic uh, inhomogeneities in, um, in graphene itself, okay? So it has certain uh, physics aspects uh, for sure, okay? So I, I would like to start uh, with this slide where I show um, this uh, graphene uh, surface in uh, 3D. So this is something I uh, picked up from uh, internet, I must admit, um, where you see a few things. One is uh, that the graphene doesn't look very flat. So it is somewhat, uh, you know, uh, its topography is uh, changing from place to place. And the second thing is this uh, color coding, which you see, uh, which is uh, indicating that actually uh, other than uh, not being flat, it also has these electronic inhomogeneities, meaning some places you have uh, more electrons as compared to uh, other places. Okay, so you can imagine that these red regions uh, have uh, high electron density, while the blue ones have lower electron density, or even they might have a whole density, meaning com completely opposite charge, okay? So this is the aspect which I am going to discuss uh, in today's uh, presentation somewhat, and what we have studied using our uh, scanning, tunneling, microscopy, uh, particularly focusing on this particular aspect, okay? So uh, just to uh, start with uh, a brief uh, introduction, which is relevant for this uh, presentation. So, uh, well, we, I can say safely, I think a majority of the people must be familiar with this, um, um, uh, sorry, uh, this uh, dispersion of graphene where you see that there are uh, two bands uh, which touch each other at the six Dirac points in the Brillouin zone. And if you focus on one Dirac point, you see this uh, conical uh, dispersion, which, uh, which says that energy actually varies linearly with the wave vector near this point with the proportionality constant that is the Fermi velocity going like 10 to the power of six meters per second, okay? So this linearity of the band near the Dirac point is what makes it very, very special, okay? So there are many uh, consequences which match with the uh, relativistic uh, fermions uh, like uh, electron, positron, and so on, okay? So that is why these are called, this is called Dirac dispersion because Dirac was the first one to sort of uh, use this aspect for describing electrons and positrons uh, and so on in the, in the relativistic limit. Okay, so one of the consequence of this linear dispersion is, uh, is the density of states. So that is basically, uh, you look at uh, the charge neutral graphene uh, if you look at it, it will have uh, its uh, Fermi energy right at the Dirac point. So when you go away from the Dirac point, you will see a variation in density of states. And since at Dirac point, you have actually no states, right? So that is what the dispersion also will sort of tell you because there is only one point at the Dirac point. So if you look at uh, the, 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 the amount of um, number of states available, that's practically zero in the, at least in the continuum limit. 
So anyway, so if you look at the uh, density of states, it's zero at the arc point, and it, it, then it builds up linearly uh, as you go away from the Dirac point. Okay. So what is uh, interesting about this aspect is that as you change the carrier density in graphene, okay, which we will see, you can do by varying the a backgate uh, voltage, which means you can uh, do a field doping uh, in graphene. So as you vary the carrier density, you see because there are no states, the Fermi energy suddenly jumps at the Dirac point because the Fermi energy goes like a square root of mod n. And when n is uh, zero, you see actually the derivative of Fermi energy is infinite at n equal to zero. So if you take def dn, it will go like one over square root of n, which will become infinity right at n equal to zero. So that means that the Fermi energy very abruptly jumps at the Dirac point, okay? So this is interesting because there are some consequences of this effect, this uh, jump that we see in, uh, in STM uh, spectra, okay? So continuing with our experimental uh, situation, okay? So what we do is we take, let's say a doped uh, silicon substrate with silicon dioxide on top of it, which is around 300 nanometer silicon dioxide. And then uh, we prepare graphene by just uh, scotch tape uh, method. And then you apply a, um, you can do transport by applying a current between the two ends of graphene and measuring the voltage between the same two ends, right? So you will get a voltage as a function of current and it is linear, so you will get a resistance. So resistance is something which you can plot as a function of the gate voltage here. So what you see is, and then you can plot resistance as a function of gate voltage. So what is the gate voltage doing here? So you see that this capacity, this uh, sorry, graphene and doped silicon, which is almost metallic, these two form two sides of a parallel plate capacitor. And when you apply a voltage between the two plates of the capacitor, you will get charge on the two sides. Okay. So if you apply, let's say, a negative voltage, graphene will be negatively charged. Okay. That is Q equal to C B. And that charge will basically distribute um, on graphene homogeneously. And that charge will go into these electronic states that we talked about when we looked at the graphene dispersion. And therefore, what will happen is this charge density, which you can calculate simply by using um, this Q equal to CD essentially. So if you look at the charge density would be the uh, number of charges per unit area, number of electrons per unit area times the electronic charge that is going to be equal to C, which is kappa epsilon zero over T. So this is per unit area. So this is per unit area capacitor, capacitance. And so this T here is thickness. So you see this N goes linearly with the back gate voltage that you apply. Okay, so this is how you vary the carrier concentration in graphene by applying this back gate voltage. Okay, so you can get a hold of some of these numbers for our devices where we use a thickness which is about 300 nanometer of the silicon dioxide whose dielectric constant is four. So you see this is how, right? So you can put a charge density of about 7.4 10 to the power 10 per centimeter square, meaning so many electrons per centimeter square, if I apply one volt of gate voltage, okay? So this is precisely how you will vary the Fermi energy, uh, meaning you change the carrier density and the electrons will fill more states in the bands of graphene, okay? So moving further, Right, so the idea, one of the fascinating idea about behind graphene is the, it's a Dirac point itself. So it offers very fascinating physics and some of it which has been explored. 
in the sense that say uh, that's a point where you have certain electron hole symmetry and uh, various other fascinating aspects okay so definitely you want to go very close to the dirac point in terms of its fermi energy okay but what actually happens in realistic graphene is uh, there are uh, this defects particularly uh, defects which carry charges okay so these defects are not exactly in graphene but uh, a lot of these defects are actually at the interface they are sitting below graphene so at the interface between graphene and the underlying substrate so if this these uh, defects carry charge then they will also provide a um, you know local uh, potential so if you imagine that the potential around a point charge by the coulomb's law goes like uh, 4 pi 1 over 4 pi epsilon not q by r so as you as you go very close to r meaning the point charge you will see a large potential so what will graphene do it will try to uh, screen this potential by inducing uh, charges in itself okay so what it that means is that if you have a positive charge graphene will create a negative charge around this nearby this impurity to shield the electric field of this positive charge okay as a result its fermi energy locally will shift okay so the idea is the fermi energy of graphene is going to go to different places at different energy values at different locations because of these defects these charge defects okay so this leads to electronic inhomogeneity or you can say potential inhomogeneity or potential disorder or whatever you name it but eventually it means that different locations will have different fermi energy or rather chemical potential relative to the dirac point okay which means that you cannot bring the whole sample to the dirac point or whole samples fermi energy to the dirac point at the same time okay now that is a problem so what you will get at most is on the average you will see that the dirac point is at the fermi energy or fermi energy is at the dirac point but if you look at locally you will see significant deviations from that right that is the effect of potential disorder so it actually it actually prevents you from going to the dirac point or taking the fermi energy to the dirac point very precisely okay so how you eliminate such uh, inhomogeneity will 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 control the properties of your sample in a big way as you see in this particular paper where they prepare a sample let's say very very carefully by suspending it and therefore it doesn't have any interface states interface defects nearby so you see it's it's a, it's a resistivity is extremely sensitive to gate voltage you see a very sharp peak as i showed in some of our sample in the previous graph you see a peak in the resistance when you are right at the dirac point because there are no carriers zero density of states as you go away from this point you see that there are carriers so resistance reduces progressively you can plot it in the inverse scale where you will see nearly linear behavior okay so that's the idea that if you go very close to dirac point you will see a peak of course a large resistance but if you are right you know if depending on the disorder this peak will get rounded more and more so if you have more disorder you will not see such a sharp peak okay so that is the idea here what is the effect of such defects charge defects on the properties of graphene okay so anyway i have taken a lot of time in this uh, introduction part so what we do in our lab is stm scanning tunneling microscopy where we can measure the topography with atomic resolution thanks to this uh, tunnel matrix sediment and the second part here is the so called spectroscopy where we fix the tip sample separation and then we can measure the density of states of the sample very very locally okay so that is the idea of the tunneling spectroscopy okay 
so coming to the realistic experiments here is the sort of you know electronic schematic we use a technique called lock in uh, modulation which which gives us both uh, the topography using the dc current as well as the um the 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 uh, local density of states which tells us the local charges on the sample right so we can get simultaneously the local density of states as well as the local topography okay so that is uh, the setup we have in our lab which is a homemade uh, stm and um, right so looking at some of the earlier studied studies that have been done on uh, graphene uh, and its homogeneity so i just show a few uh, papers that are published uh, before uh, our work where they see clearly that okay so this is like the potential fluctuation in graphene so this is again using uh, stm only right so you see that yes indeed there is significant homogeneity okay and this is another paper on the same thing but this actually does more than just looking at homogeneity in the sense this one um, uh, tries to uh, look at the physics uh, screening physics of graphene itself which means as you change the gate voltage actually the the length scale of uh, these uh, inhomogeneities changes significantly as you go the, to the dirac okay so this is uh, yeah so this again captures certain screening physics aspects of uh, graphene in a nice way uh, in the sense that the density of states at the dirac point is actually uh, low or nearly zero so the screening length at the dirac point is very large and therefore the size of these electronic inhomogeneities goes becomes very large as you go to the dirac okay so here is how we prepare our uh, devices we just uh, use this scotch tape uh, and stamp this with graphene uh, flakes on it we stamp it on a silicon substrate and then uh, we actually put a, um, a a tungsten wire aligned with this uh, graphene flake and uh, so under microscope of course because the graphene that we have is about uh, maybe few tens of uh, microns in size so maybe 20 30 40 50 50 and depending on that size we choose the wire to uh, to use as a mask to place uh, electrical contacts on graphene because we have to uh, uh, draw the tunnel current eventually so this is a, a technique which we call wire masking so if you place a wire you see this is the graphene if you can see on your side and it is the gold um, uh, contacts on both sides of this uh, graphene okay so one can actually cover from for all four side by doing another wire masking in this direction so that you can actually see this kind of uh, structure more clearly optically and that is actually a good idea of when you are doing stm because one has to align the stm tip nicely with this uh, region which is around 20 by 20 microns so it's quite a small so this can be quite challenging so we have done also lithography wise these such devices okay where uh, okay so we have done transport and raman so you see well raman is good 2d peak and g peak uh, so we can fit as a single peak and everything and uh, so we have reasonably good uh, graphene defect free and uh, this is our stm setup it's a homemade system so we have a vacuum stm with uh, which is actually a cryogenic vacuum and the stm head is here which was published a uh, long time ago in 2001 and then we have also added a 2d positioner in uh, in uh, here so in 2008 so you can see that um, this positioner helps us align this graphene in front of the tip and then uh, we have various contacts for uh, gate voltage and even transport and the tunnel current and so on okay so this is the student actually who did uh, this work uh, anil uh, who actually uh, graduated uh, some time uh, last year or so actually and uh, he is right now in israel uh, in wiseman institute 
So this is again, uh, since it's a homemade STM and the everything, so homemade supplies for uh, aligning the tip in, uh, in front of the STM, in front of the graphene. So here are some of the um, STM images of uh, graphene. So this is a large area graphene. And when you zoom in, you see nice uh, atomic resolution on graphene with this STM. And uh, if you look at the large area, you see a roughness, which is of the order of, let's say, one nanometer, correct? And uh, this is basically coming from the underlying uh, silicon dioxide uh, substrate, because this uh, uh, silicon dioxide is uh, thermally grown. So graphene actually takes the topography of the silicon dioxide pretty much. And there's another sample where we were fortunate to have a uh, interface between bilayer graphene and a single layer graphene. You can uh, see some things like if you go to single layer graphene, you see honeycomb-like atomic resolution. And if you go to bilayer graphene, you end up seeing a triangular lattice, okay? So that is a clear difference between the two sides. Also the roughness, if you see carefully, is uh, more on the single layer size uh, side as compared to the bilayer graphene. Anyway, so coming on, moving on. So there is one thing which, uh, which actually one of the students, earlier students spent quite a bit of time on tip gating effect. So the idea, well, I don't know if I can explain in such short time, but to summarize, actually you see certain features in the um, in the in the uh, DIDV spectra which are unusual, which were not anticipated earlier. So what we see is uh, that actually there are two minima which we see in, uh, in the local spectra and they evolve as you change the gate voltage. So these two minima we could explain successfully that uh, using the fact that, uh, that it's not just the back gate uh, silicon which acts as a gate, it's actually the tip also on top which is used to probe the density of states the tip also acts as a uh, as a top gate so that will also shift the fermi energy when you apply the bias voltage between tip and sample in order to probe the density of states okay so this was an interesting consequence that we published in uh, applied physics letter at that time and uh, well then uh, this is others work so i will not say which also actually explained some of aspect using tip gating effect Okay, so this is uh, something, uh, this idea has been used by several groups uh, later on. Um, so if I uh, look at another aspect that, uh, okay, that the, if I look at local tunnel spectra, you see that the tunnel spectra and the two minima at some locations of graphene evolve nicely. And in some of the locations, actually one of the minima evolves uh, uh, quite a lot, but the one of the minima is not moving at all with the back gate voltage. So this is something uh, which puzzled us for a long time, which uh, eventually which we, we, could, uh, we thought, okay, this could be because of the reduction in Fermi velocity because of defects. But uh, the defects that you need to reduce the Fermi velocity are atomic uh, hard defects, which we don't have in our samples because these are actually um, exfoliated samples as compared to some people who studied where we, they bombarded graphene with uh, uh, heavy ions and that causes atomic uh, scale defects. So that, uh, couldn't, that didn't quite uh, agree with what we were seeing. So eventually we, uh, we ex ended up explaining our results based on the interface states. What that means is that uh, you actually graphene's Fermi energy get pinned to uh, the Dirac point for a, uh, for a good amount of doping because of these uh, interface states, okay? So this is, uh, took a lot of uh, time, I must say. Anyway, so, but eventually we ended up, uh, we got this paper published in JPCM, Journal of Physics Condensed Matter, uh, some point. Then uh, we looked at the electronic inhomogeneity and how it changes with the back gate voltage. So uh, you see that these are left side, this is like topography images at different gate voltages. These are also the same thing and this one also. So at different gate voltages, you see topography images remain more or less same. 
but you see the conductance maps actually change drastically right so actually they change their contrast quite a bit so minus 50 volt you have this as conductance map while at plus 50 volt you have conductance map like this so it turns out that plus 50 volt corresponds to the very close to the uh, dirac point so the idea is when you come close to the dirac point right you see a significant change in the contrast of the conductance map okay so what we concluded from this part was um, was uh, it's not only the inhomogeneity uh, in uh, graphene that you see because of these interface states, but also this inhomogeneity actually evolves with gate voltage because these interface charges, interface defects exchange charge with graphene. So they change their charge state, okay? Let's say from positive to negative or negative to positive, depending on the gate voltage, okay? So if you, let's say, apply a positive gate voltage, right, you will have a tendency of the interface states to accumulate negative charges, okay? As you change the gate towards a positive gate, they will have a tendency to reverse their charge state. And if they do so, so some of the states will change their charge state, but others don't. So what you see here, for example, if I compare these two extreme images in the, let's say, next uh, plot here. So you see this is like uh, minus 50 plus 50. So you see some of the regions have changed their contrast completely opposite. So this was like positive here, right? A butterfly-like structure, which has become a negative dark, right? So it's a bright to dark, but there are a lot of places where dark is still remaining dark. Okay, so for example, these three points are still dark in both. These are also dark. This is dark. This is dark. This is dark. So a lot of these things, right? Some of these dark places have come from dark themselves, but some of these dark places come from the bright places. So this is where the interface defects have actually changed their charge state as compared to what it was at minus 50 volt. So this can be captured more from this some sort of a correlation image, right? Where you see that, uh, that okay, some places there is a reversal of contrast, but there are places where there is no reversal of contrast. But on the whole, if you take an average of this um, correlation map, you get no correlation because this dark and bright places, they sort of cancel each other out. And then you see a co average cross correlation coefficient to be zero. But locally, there is correlation which is changing, which leads to uh, this river, which is coming from the reversal of the uh, charge state of the interface. Team. So not only we see the inhomogeneities because of the interface charges, but we also see that these uh, interface charges are changing their charge state as you go to different gate voltages. So, so these inhomogeneities are there and they respond to the gate voltage, which is uh, quite a remarkable finding of uh, this work, which was uh, not quite uh, studied uh, before this one. So we got this paper in PRB uh, rather quickly. Okay, so there are various other aspects which I have skipped for now because there is not too much time, but this is something which I would like to highlight from this work that yes, we see such nanoscale uh, stuff, which is quite remarkable with this STM, okay? And uh, the one last thing which I will show one of our papers, uh, so because these interface states change their charge state, you see something like something called hysteresis in the transport properties of graphene. So you just look at the resistance variation as a function of gate voltage. And you see as you sweep gate in one direction, you see one type of resistance behavior. As you reverse the direction, you see a different uh, behavior, right? So there is a shift in the Dirac point with the sweep direction. And in fact, what is important here is if you wait at the end points for a long time, you will see that this shift can be very large, okay? Because at these end points, you are giving more time 
for the to these interface states to change their charge state okay so if you apply a large positive gate voltage the interface will have uh, you know would like to accumulate more negative charges okay which will dope graphene in a different way so that is one thing which we see as hysteresis but more this has been seen by lots of groups but more remarkable in this work is uh, something that we can actually do is controlling things by gate and heating so what you can do is if you if you anneal this sample at high voltages then you get rid of lot of interface states and then as you come to low temperature like room temperature you don't see any hysteresis okay now if you come to this state now what you can do is you apply a gate voltage right and keep the sample hot for some time and then you cool it with the gate voltage on so this leads to a shift in the dirac peak right so you have no hysteresis at room temperature but by doing this gate annealing you can shift the dirac point of graphene by significant amount okay so you can sort of engineer the charge stored in the interface states by gate annealing okay so that is very uh, remarkable in the sense uh, that if we can uh, find uh, faster ways of manipulating this interface charge we can easily get memory devices out of this graphene okay so that is uh, and uh, as maybe that is a functional material aspect of this work which i can highlight uh, for this uh, for this uh, conference okay so that pretty much brings to the end of my talk because i think i have already crossed my time but uh, here are some summary points which i have um, i have said but the last point i said that these interface traps are unwanted when you look, when you want to get uh, good graphene devices but maybe they are wanted they may be useful for other applications perhaps like memory applications okay so that is something which i i i want to uh, sort of highlight at the end that interface charges interface defects store charge which can be manipulated we have seen that charge changing using the stm right and we have been able to manipulate that charge using gate annealing okay so that's the sort of the take home message which i would like to convey and so with this i will like to acknowledge uh, my students particularly sham who did uh, this work on tip gating effect and anil who did lot of this uh, most of this inhomogeneity work which led to several publications um, Uh, and then the funding from DST and IIT Kanpur. So with this, I close. Thank you very much for your time and everything. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Anjan, for giving. such a nice lecture on your topic now we are running against the time so i would like to invite professor sadia are you pro yes professor sadia is now online professor sadia is joining us from republic of korea this title of talk is dye degradation and trace metal ions ion detection using organic electronics for environmental protection professor sadia has done his phd in chemistry from jamia millia islamia university new delhi india after doing phd professor shadia moved to john bok national university republic of korea presently the research interest lies in the field of bioconvergence science 
assistant professor yes uh, assistant professor in department of bioconvergence science basically research current research focuses on proboscoid solar cell organic solar cells sensors catalyst and optoelectronic devices she is specialized in manufacturing advanced energy materials and their nano composites she has won more than 120 peer reviewed papers in her credit contributed many more chapters and books inventor and co-inventor of many patents with this introduction i would uh, request professor shadia to kindly deliver his talk from republic of korea professor shadia yeah thank you professor for introducing me and uh, before starting my discussion i would like to say thanks to the organizing committee members for inviting me to icfm 20 and also giving me the opportunity to talk about the futuristic materials so let me share the screen okay oh, please allow me some time i guess i am facing some problem i am unable to share it may i help you professor sadia Yes, professor. Actually, I am trying to share my screen, but somehow I am unable to do that. <laughs> Actually, first you need to open your PowerPoint on your desktop, then start. Okay. Okay. Screen. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for guiding me. Yeah. So. Yes. So. Yes. Could you even, you yeah. See. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Professor. So let's start my today's discussion, and it is uh, about uh, the dye degradation and the trace metal ion detection using organic electronics for environmental remediation. So these are the contents of my today's talk. I would be talking about the synthesis of organic semiconductors, which are also called as organic Excuse electronics. Excuse me, ma'am. Yes. Yeah? Can you click slideshow to go to full screen mode? Yes, sure, please. Wait a minute. So, thank you. These are the contents which I am sharing for my today's talk. I would be first discussing about the organic semiconductors material. Then I would be discussing their applications for photocatalytic and for chemical sensor. So we all know what are semiconductor materials. So let me not. go in details but here i am just giving a brief introduction about these semiconductor materials they are prepared they can be prepared from several procedures like through chemical vapor deposition sol gel pyrolysis electro deposition and so on and these semiconductor materials could be of any type like this could be of carbon materials polymer materials or nanostructure materials and we see their applications for several purposes like they are widely used for environmental remediations for the photocatalytic activities and for sensor of course so today i would be discussing a specific type of semiconductor that is the organic semiconductor since they are very much promising for the environmental remediations solar cells nano electronic devices photocatalytic application clean energy productions and for the biological uses so let's first start with the photocatalyst this is the very sim simple terminology and i'm sure that we all know about it so let's just discuss in brief the photocatalyst it is basically the materials which in the presence of light and water the photocatalyst creates strong oxidation agents leading to the formation of the host to break down the organic matter into carbon dioxide and water The best example to understand the photocatalyst is chlorophyll, which is a natural photocatalyst. And chlorophyll it captures the sunlight to turn water and carbon dioxide into oxygen and glucose. These are some of the basic functions of the photocatalyst. Like uh, we apply photocatalyst for the sterilizing effect, for deodorizing effect, for air purifying effect, water purification, 
and last not least we observe the effect of uh, application of this photocatalyst material for the degradation of toxic dyes and chemicals so let's start with the first work what we have done here we have synthesized and designed a special kind of organic material and we have applied it for the photocatalytic degradation of rose bengal dye so let me first explain why we have opted for the organic semiconductors as we know that these organic semiconductors they observe more light that means they are of low band gap material high absorption coefficient they show the large exciton diffusion length which means the typical exciton diffusion length of few nanometers they have proper energy levels for exciton sp splitting and they show the high charge carrier mobilities they are stable under sunlight and they are of low cost and thermal evaporation it shows thermal evaporation properties so in this specific molecule which we have designed we paid a special attention for incorporating the benzo selenide dissolves as central core unit the purpose for incorporating this benzo selenide dissolve central core unit is just because it is a p type semiconductor which show excellent optical and electronic properties particularly apart from that we have also incorporated the selenium unit in the donor acceptor skeleton which drastically increases the charge carrier and hole mobilities facilitates the charge transport properties along with enhanced pi pi stacking effects so this is the molecule which we have synthesized in our work and since as you could see it has big name so we have abbreviated as rppf addition of this since i have mentioned that we have incorporated the selenium unit apart from that we have also incorporated the thiophene and fluorine unit for the synthesis of this molecule as it provides the strong electron donating nature it tailors the optical properties and enhances the solubility parameters so this is the work which we have done here is first we have synthesized the organic molecule that is organic semiconductor which we have named as rtbscf and apart from that we made it functionalized nano composite with pcbm which is nothing phenyl butyric acid methyl ester and we made this nano composite in different compositions so what we did here we have kept the composition of our organic molecule as constant and we varied the concentration of pcbm in the nano composite material and we have found that when we have taken a specific uh, concentration of the nano composite material that is the in one to two weight percentage ratio it shows the promising catalytic degradation of rose bengal dye and we degraded this dye with 98.6 percentage and the beauty of this work it took very less time that is just 90 minutes so what we have assumed that it probably because of high absorption range in the visible region sufficient light generated redox potential and long lifetime of the photo generated excitons this is the brief discussion how we have synthesized and designed our molecule as you could see that synthesis synthesizing the organic molecules is a time taking job and it involves the several procedures like it involves the synthesis of intermediates and with the pro, uh, with undertaking of these intermediate we are capable of synthesizing the final material that is rtbscf here so as i said that we have synthesized the intermediate first and it is also very significant to verify to characterize these intermediates since these are the basic material which would be generating the final material that is rtbscf so this is the nmr spectra which i am exhibiting here and this is the nmr spectra of our intermediate materials it exists to both the proton nmr as well as the carbon nmr which shows that the aromatic protons on benzenes and thiophene units are coupled with each other which is also confirmed from the existence of the doublet peaks then this is the uh, nmr spectra of uh, our final material that is our final organic molecule which we have synthesized and this also been characterized with the proton nmr as well as with the carbon nmr in addition to this we have characterized our synthesized ma material with mass spectroscopy as well and as you could see we have 
found that the molecular mass which we have calculated is very much closer to the one which we have found that is 644.07 and it assures us it confirms that our excellent composition of our synthesized molecule thereafter we check the structural characterization through a very sim simple characterization technique that is ftir so in first here we have shown the ftir of our pristine molecule then the in here it is showing the FTIR of the nanocomposite thin film, specifically when it is present in the molar weight percentage ratio of 1 is to 2. And uh, what we have observed that the, all the significant peaks of our molecule is present in the composite material. Apart from that, it has also shown the specific peaks which are assigned to the PCBM. It shows that our composite has been formed since we have observed the peaks from both the root material as well as from the composite material that is PCB1. And then we did some thermal characterizations like from TGA that is thermogravimetric analysis. You can see that it shows the higher decomposition temperature at around 305 degrees centigrade with a small weight loss of only 5%. Whereas if you have a look at DSC, that is differential scanning calorimetry, it shows the three melting points at different temperatures. Along with, we have also observed the crystalline temperature at the temperature of 338 degrees centigrade, which shows the, the liquid crystalline nature of our synthesized organic semiconductor due to the presence of a side chain thiophene unit and the self-assembly pattern of RTHACF. These are the significant characterization, which is optical characterization, and it is exhibiting the UV spectra. So for observing the UV characterization, what we did here, we first observed the UV of our molecule in a solution form. And for this, we have taken chloroform as a solvent. After that, we have checked the UV characterization of a synthesized organic semiconductor material in the form of film. And then we check it, the uh, UV characteristics of the composite thin films. So what you can see in the case of the solution form, it exhibits the two characteristic peaks which have appeared at the position of 344 and roughly the second one has appeared at the position around 486 nanometer, which itself confirms the pi pi interactions as well as the intermolecular charge interactions from the donor to the acceptor moieties of a molecule. And in the case of thin film, we have observed a slight red shift in the absorption peak, which we have assumed that it's probably because of the strong interaction between the two moieties, that is the PCBM, as well as our synthesized molecule. And if you have a look at here in the composite thin films, we have seen that the absorption has occurred mainly in the visible region, which is one of the most promising things because it assures us that it is capable enough for exhibiting the catalytic degradation under the visible light region. In addition to the optical properties, we have performed the photoluminescence and like we did in UV absorption characterization, we have performed the PL characterizations for all, like for the solution state, for the thin film state, as well as for the nanocomposite thin films. In case of the solution state, we can observe a strong PL peak, which has occurred at the position roughly at about 637 nanometers, which we have observed that it blue shifted in case of the film and it has now appeared at the position around 306, uh, 630 nanometers which probably due to the aggregations due to H aggregation or J aggregation whereas the beauty which we have observed here for the case of the nanocomposite films you can see the peak has shown a quenching this quenching is definitely due to the synergic effect of both the materials. That means the effect which has come out from a synthesized molecule and also the contributing effect from PCBM. And furthermore, we wanted to make sure the chemical bonding between our synthesized composites. 
so we went we did this xps characterizations which we have shown here and here occurrence of all the significant peaks that is for the carbon selenium oxygen as well as for the nitrogen it assured that our material our nanocomposite films has been formed and last not least we characterized our material with the morphological characterizations here i am showing the afm result that is atomic pulse microscopy result and what we have observed when we have taken the nanocomposite films in a specific ratio of 1 is to 2 weight percentage the root mean square value is little lesser as compared to the other nanocomposite thin films and we assume that because of this less roughness it provides the smooth surface of the thin film morphology whereas if you have a look at, at the composition of 1 is to 1 uh, ratio nanocomposite thin film somehow the roughness is little higher that is 2.34 nanometer and with this we assume that this uh, higher roughness may be responsible for the creation of the aggregation and it uh, might hamper the generation as well as the transportation of charge carriers during the photocatalytic oxidation procedures. And after that, we characterize our material through the electrochemical properties that is through CV, cyclovoltammetry analysis, as we wanted to calculate the existence of the HOMO and the LUMO level of a synthesized molecule. If you look at the CV spectra, it shows the redox reaction uh, nature. That means there is the existence of both the oxidation as well as the reduction peak here. And from this, we have calculated the HOMO and the LUMO level of a material as 3.31 and 5.33 electron volt respectively. And also, if you can have a look here with PCBM, it matches well, means the LOMO of our synthesized material matches well with the LOMO of PCBM, leading to the fast generation of electron during the photocatalytic activity. Since we were worried about knowing the hydrophobicity of our material because we are applying it for the water remediation, so we wanted to make sure if our material is hydrophobic enough for the application purpose. So we performed this uh, content angle uh, characterization and you could see when we have taken the nanocomposite film in 1 is to 2 ratio it shows the higher contact angle of 91.02 which clearly shows that our material is hydrophobic in nature and certainly it is ready for the application for photocatalytic degradation this is how we have performed the photocatalytic activity of our materials through this, we are first we have applied a pristine material that is without our catalytic material, and we have observed that in that case the rose bengal dye has degraded very less, and we didn't observe the much difference. Whereas when we have incorporated our catalytic material for the degradation purposes, we have seen an immense change, and this catalyst had degraded the dye with a promising result of 98.3 percentage back to into in a very less time duration that is just of 90 minutes these are some of the samples which we have taken a photograph of that this the initial stage and after that we have seen a sample it after 30 minutes of degradation and finally this how it looked like when the complete degradation has occurred Shadia. yes pro professor um, uh, may I request to you to conclude because you are running against oh. the time Oh, oh, so, so I'm so sorry, Professor. Let me finish it quickly. So these are some how we have performed it. We have just did it with the UV absorption properties. And as you could see that there is a degradation in the UV absorption peak, which shows that our dye has degraded well. And from this pie chart, we have shown that most of the dye degradation has occurred within the duration of the 30 minutes. Let me skip it quickly. We have also characterized our material through the mass spectra. The purpose for that, we wanted to make sure if this is not a shear procedure of absorption. So we have done the mass spectra and we have found that the, our basic peak mass signal, which has occurred at the position of 1022, it has split it into several other mass signals. And these mass signals are corresponded to the intermediates, which we have obtained here. And this is how, let me briefly explain the purpose for this. This is uh, 
uh, our material which we have synthesized, which upon the light illumination, there is a generation of electrons from the LOMO level. And the purpose for taking the PCBM here is simple that because P PCBM is a, having the nature of electron acceptance. So this helps in uh, providing or ex uh, pro prohibiting the recombination of electrons and charges leading to the fast de degradation of rose Bengal jai. This is the first work and let me for, uh, quickly conclude our second work. Here we have synthesized the, uh, another molecule and we have incorporated the indane diol based organic semiconductors. So, and up with that, we have make up the composites with the carbon carbonaceous material, specifically with the graphene oxide. And the purpose for that, because we all know this graphene oxide, it show a specific, high specific surface area. It is highly chemical stable and it show the pi conjugation along with exhibiting the hydrophilic properties. This is a brief discussion how we have synthesized the material. Let me move it quickly. This is the characterizations which I have already explained some here. And with this, this is showing the physical morphological properties of a material, showing that in case when we have taken the uh, nanocomposite in one is to two ratio, it is very much promising as we when we have increased the composition of graphene oxide in the nanocomposite film, it's somehow showing the aggregated morphology, which definitely be not favorable for the sensor purpose, purposes. This is the characterization which we have done. And let me quickly discuss the sensor properties. As we have seen that here we have used our nanocomposite material, that is the material which we have synthesized and it's nanocomposite with graphene oxide. We have applied it as the electrode material and we used it for the detection of the heavy metals. And here we have found that our material, our sensor probe is good enough in sensing the chromium as well as the copper ions. These are some of the characterization electrochemical properties which we have done and we have formed a promising sensitivity for the case of chromium this much and whereas in case of the copper it is 101.47. These are the properties since we want to make sure that our material is stable enough. So what we have done, we have made different electrode materials. Like in each case, we have taken the six electrodes and under and we prepared this electrode under the similar condition, or same conditions. And we didn't find any much difference in all the electrodes. Like you could see there is no difference in the CV analysis. And also we tested the, our sensors for the stability purpose by consecutively uh, che checking the sensing properties for 30 consecutive days and we didn't find any much deterioration in our sense of uh, probe. And this is how we have checked the real samples here for the real sample purpose. We have taken the tap water and we have found that in case uh, when we have taken the PBS solution for the tap water, it shows our less signal both in case of chromium and copper, which means that our sensor is capable enough for presenting its properties in real samples too. So here are the conclusions. What we have done in our work, we have synthesized two different molecules and we have applied for different applications that is for the photocatalytic purpose as well as for the chemical sensors. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you Professor, Professor Shadia. Thank you Professor. for giving such a nice deliberations on dye. <clears throat> Dimetal, may I, may I see uh, Professor Manoj Gupta online? Yes. I am here, sir. Yeah, 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 yeah. So now let us move towards the next invited talk to be delivered by Dr. Manoj Kumar Gupta. The title of his talk is Piezoelectric oxide nanostructures based flexible nano generators. May, may I take just uh, two minutes from our audience to just introduce Dr. Manoj Kumar Gupta. He is scientist at uh, CSIR Advanced Materials and Research Institute Bhopal. Before joining this institute, Dr. Gupta is DST inspired faculty at Department of Physics, Aishar Bhopal. He has 
illustrious educational career now without taking much time i would like to invite dr manoj kumar gupta to kindly deliver his lecture because we are running against the time so please start your lecture your invited talk professor manoj k gupta hello yes dr manoj gupta we can hear you हेलो यस डॉक्टर गुप्ता प्लीज कंटिन्यू प्लीज प्रोसीड ओके थैंक यू सर सर मैं स्क्रीन Dr Gupta is there any issue from your side
So I think there is some problem from uh, Dr. Manoj Gupta side. So I would request the chairman of the session, Professor R.S. Singh, sir, to move on to next speaker. Hello. Yes, sir. We can hear you, please. Yes, he has not joined. Uh, I think there is some problem uh, in the network from uh, his side. So please uh, move on okay, to the next speaker. Okay, okay, no problem. Whether Dr. P.K. Singh is on online? Yes, yes, yes Dr. P.K. Singh is with us. Okay, okay, okay. So may I invite Pro uh, Professor P.K. Singh from Sharda University, Greater Noida, to kindly deliver the invited talk on uh, his topic, electrochemical devices using ionic liquid dobed polymer electrolyte. With us, may I welcome Professor Yanbi Singh. Sir, it's a uh, Great pleasure to welcome you in the second day, in the morning session of the second day of the International Conference on Futuristic Materials. Professor P. K. Singh, to introduce Professor P. K. Singh, let me take a while because uh, there is a, a little bit glitch. Just a minute. I am opening his... Uh, by data. Okay. Professor uh, P. K. Singh is the head of the Department of Physics and Environment. He has did his PhD from Banaras Hindu University. And nowadays, he is working in Department of Physics, a School of Basic Sciences and Research at the University. He has uh, done his postdoctoral at South Korea, Turkey, Norway, around six years. He has done, he has 181 papers to his credits, 175 international, uh, sorry, more ah, than- sir, dozen, More than dozens of international conferences he has attended. He is editorial member in five international journals. Whether PK Singh is online or not, let me check. Okay, Dr. Amrish, are you hearing me? Dr. Amrish? So probably he has not joined us. Actually, Dr. PK Singh is with us, but uh, I think. Uh... So uh, please unmute him. Yes, I'm uh, continuously he, he asking him to unmute. You. Probably he is not hearing you. Professor P.K. Singh, sir, can you hear me? No, you can phone him. You can phone him. So uh, kindly contact him on phone. Okay, sir, give me some time. I will call him. Okay, no problem. Because uh, actually we have only 20 minutes to, to be allotted for the speakers. That's the problem. So let me take this uh, time to welcome our audiences. Professor Neeraj Misra is here. Professor Dev Kumar Mahato has joined. Dr. Abhimanyu K. Singh is with us. Professor Shugriu Nath Tiwari, Professor Lallan Yadav, Professor N.B. Singh Sar. We are, we are organizing, taking guidance from you. So Dr. Aprati Pati has joined Chhatresh Dubey 
from Shiv Nodder University has joined. Professor Rakesh Tiwari has joined so many <coughs> illustrious audience has joined Dr. Amriz. Kindly talk to Dr. P. K. Singh. Yes, sir. I am continuously asking him to unmute himself. No, no. His, his... Yes, Dr. Sarita Ra. You can call Dr. Sarita Ra. Okay. Dr. Sarita Ra uh, is no, no. unmuted. Yes, I am online, sir. So you can you can deliver your lecture, Dr. Sure, Sarita. Sir. Sure, sure, sir. Sure. Okay, okay, okay. Let me let me. So yes, let. Sir. Dr. Amrish, may I move to Dr. Sarita to request uh, her to deliver a, her talk? Dr. Amrish? Yes, sir. Uh, actually, Professor P.K. Singh is also uh, available. Uh -huh. Okay. Yes, you can okay. see. Let us welcome. Uh -huh. <coughs> okay. Dr. P.K. Singh, actually, we are searching you, sir. We are searching whether you, where have you gone? So let me again welcome uh -huh. Dr. P.K. Singh and invite him to kindly deliver his talk because we have spent almost 10 minutes and I have already introduced you. So kindly, uh -huh. kindly initiate your talk. Yeah, yeah, sir. Third, third invited talk in the today's morning session. So please start your talk, Dr. P.K. Singh. So thank you, sir, for giving me this opportunity. I think uh, I, I feel extremely sorry because I am late, a little bit late due to some of my other uh, activity work. I think Professor N.B. Singh, sir, is sitting in front of me. He know the, the, I have some medical task to do. So, but any, anyhow, it is nothing related with my talk today. So due to that type of work, uh, I am a little bit late and now I am trying to uh, maybe upload my slide. It will take another one to two minutes in between that one. I am going to start my talk. Sir, just give me only one or two minutes. I am, I am not able to share my presentation. May I help you, sir? Uh, just a minute. But it's uh, maybe... Well, I think uh, Ambaris. Yes, sir. I think uh, some permission, maybe, please, sir. No. no, sir. You already have permission. I think I am not able to upload my slide. Uh, upload so, you want to share? I, I think uh, meanwhile, I think uh, if, if you permit me. Actually, uh, you should open uh, your uh, PowerPoint slides on your desktop, then go to share screen and open I, that slide. I have already go to share screen, then new share. share. Have you already, have you opened your uh, PowerPoint slides on your desktop? Uh, no, no, I think I could not open, that's why. You should follow. Ah, okay. okay. You can also open now. Yes, now now I open my yes, slide yes. and now please thing. go to slideshow. Share and then and share. Okay. Then share it's a PR new share. Is it? Sir, yeah. we can see your screen. Your PowerPoint. Now, now it is visible. Yes, yes. No. Please click on the slide show. Slide. So I think uh, just. Uh, is it okay? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, Fine. Yeah. Thank you, Embarish, and uh, thank you, Singh, sir, for giving me at least 
10 minutes late permission for presenting my work and uh, the title which i am going to present today it is related with ionic liquid uh, polymer electrolyte for electrochemical devices so most of electrochemical devices uh, based on polymer electrolyte i am not going to touch i am going to touch only my present area of research work which i continue here in sarda university now i think uh, i am little bit move faster because i have already uh, running late here i am working with a good laboratory which is known as material research laboratory my guru professor nb singh sir know better than me we have we established a good laboratory related to material science here in sarda university it is supervised by many of my seniors which mentioned here professor mehra professor rc singh myself and uh, my other senior professor bhaskar bhattacharya now he professor bhattacharya already joined banaras hindu university apart from that one we have a very good teachers group also here they are working in material science area under the banner of this material research laboratory now we have a good team of uh, phd scholars which i have mentioned here apart from that one i think uh, with our group we have lucky that we are working with graduate and post graduate student to continue research further here in material research laboratory so my talk related with motivation the area where i am working methodology a one common methodology i am going to tell you and then some old results and discussions on basis of that one and on basis of all those things i am finally going to conclude my talk so the area where i am working particularly it is related with it is known as ion conducting solid because uh, my professor uh, my phd supervisor professor suresh chandra late professor suresh chandra he introduced me in this area so this area is also known as super ionic solid fast ion conductor or solid electrolyte now if i am going to classify solid electrolyte various uh, varieties of materials class available here so it's may be solid electrolyte glassy material composite and nano composite material and then polymer electrolyte so the area where currently i am interested and i have already continued and put some research contribution it is known as polymer electrolyte the devices i have already told you that if we are able to anyone can able to develop a good you can say polymer electrolyte good ionic conductivity maybe that uh, polymer electrolyte you can use as a electrolyte in battery fuel cell and other electrochemical devices now i am focusing mainly here on this topic dye sensitized solar cell so in area where i am going to talk it is related with solar cell area and these are my motivator none other than i think you can say first one in number first place is my phd supervisor let professor suresh chandra and these three gentlemen you can say they are my postdoctoral collaborators they are always with me till now and they and we have a very good relation with them and with the, their collaboration i am trying to do some work in polymer electrolyte last one here is professor hasmi who is always putting a good umbrella related to polymer electrolyte on my head he is in delhi university now the area where i am going to discuss it is related with ion conducting polymer electrolyte the basic problem with this class of materials it is also known as polyethers based materials polyethers is a class of uh, polymers you can say where people are also treat it as a you can say insulating materials insulating polymers so our main aim is to adding ionic conductivity in the insulating polymer and if we are getting a such good ionic conductivity then we are further thinking to apply it in any electrochemical devices which i have already talked with so there are several already methods popular in literature like plasticizer people have dubbed many plasticizer in this Uh, you can say insulating polymers formation of blends composite addition of ceramic insulating fill and nano material semiconducting materials quantum that many more materials 
Now here I am going to give you a particular talk about, you can say, a new dopant. New dopant, it is not new. This material is already well known by chemistry and people already name it as eutectic melts. Nowadays, it is popular with ionic liquids name. So ionic liquid is a eutectic melts. And I think since I am not uh, going to brief about ionic liquid, particularly to use as an electrolyte in this uh, polymer electrolyte, we are basically focused on ionic liquid which have a low viscosity. I am going to tell you why we are focusing on low viscosity ionic liquid and hydrophobic ionic liquid. These two particular parameters of ionic liquid which attract particularly me as a researcher in this polymer electrolyte. So some common, you can say, useful properties of ionic liquid is already in literature that it is composed of ions only with low melting point, below 100 degrees centigrade, non-flammable, non-volatile, and many more. Wide ESW, electrochemical stability window, everybody knows about that one. So it is already in literature that if you put ionic liquid, it is going to enhance electrical conductivity. There are many theories behind that one. Then play the important role of charge carrier, as well as a plasticizer. And if you are able to develop, you can say, iodized based eutectic melts, then maybe it is useful in, you can say, disensitized solar cell, because where you need a redox couple, I minus and I3 minus. And then it is now a candidate for electrochemical devices. It's already mentioned in literature. Now, these are our uh, some of earlier publication, which I have already published uh, in this area, polyethers with low viscosity ionic liquid. Now, here, apart from that one, we have also published uh, too many, you can say, biopolymer electrolyte probed with this low viscosity ionic liquid. And I have already told you that particularly ionic liquid case area, most basically as a physicist, we love with low viscosity ionic liquid because we know that viscosity and mobility are inversely proportional to each other. So as much as low viscosity ionic liquid, maybe it is going to enhance conductivity because it is inversely proportional with mobility, you can say. And mobility is directly related with conductivity. So we have already published many more, more than 100 publications in this area. Now the another one, you mean say, particularly for uh, this discussion, I want to talk to something related to disensitized solar cell. Disensitized solar cell is a solar cell. And why its name is die? Because if there is a, as like a normal solar cell, it has two electrodes, you can say working electrode, doped with semiconducting uh, nanomaterials, wide band gap semiconducting nano. Then there is a counter electrode. And this one is the main portion, electrolyte portion, where we are playing. We are playing with polymer with ionic liquid, doped good ion conducting polymer electrolyte. So this is a good slide. If anybody is interested, I have already mentioned its reference number. I am not going to discuss a BSSC working principle because there is short of time. Anybody, if he or she may be interested, he or she can directly contact to me either through mail or any, any other popular resources. Now, electrolyte in disensitized solar area, it's already popular. Electrolyte is liquid electrolyte. People already use it because it has a most high conductivity, liquid electrolyte. But there are some other alternatives. And if you see the advantage or disadvantage properties of other popular electrolyte, polymer electrolyte is one of the, you can say, best suited candidate. I cannot say that it is going to replace liquid electrolyte. It is best suited candidate in place of liquid electrolyte. So we are using our ionic liquid doped polymer electrolyte directly in electrolyte area. In these the two electrodes, you can say. This is a schematic diagram, how we are making disensitized solar cell in our own material research laboratory 
in Sardar University. Now this one is the portion I can already told you that this is electrolyte portion sandwiched between two electrodes. So electrode we have already synthesized here. It's already popular in literature. Particularly we are focusing or we are working in this area, electrolyte area where we are using ionic liquid polymer electrolyte. Now there are few characterization uh, you can say results related to working electrode, I am going to show you. This is same image of working electrode doped with mesoporous TiO2, nanocrystalline TiO2. This is cross-sectional view. This slide, nothing related with electrolyte. This is related only with, you can say, disensitized solar cell working electrode. So you can see, sir? yes. As we are running out of time, so please conclude within five minutes. Okay, please, okay, sir. okay, 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 sir. So these are some characterization tools, uh, characterization related with electrolyte, not electrode. Now I am coming to electrolyte portion. This is solution cast method in which we are making the ionic liquid doped polymer electrolyte. Some of the characterization tool which we have, we have impedance analyzer. So using that one, we have major conductivity. We can Again, uh, recorded XRD, we have recorded DSC. DSC we don't have, but we are sending our sample to another, uh, you can say, another collaborator. And then finally, we have a solar, cell, uh, solar simulator, which we are in process of going to purchase. So using which one, we have measured efficiency point of view. Now, I think uh, this one is the last slide. So I can say conclusion point of view, in our laboratory, we are focusing on ionic liquid doped polymer electrolyte, which may be suitable for, you can say, many electrochemical devices, out of which we are working in super capacitor and isosceptive solar cell area to use these ionic liquid doped polymer electrolyte. So thank you very much for providing me this opportunity and present my work here, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. P.K. Singh. You, <clears throat> you have just finished your lecture within time, although you have started late. Yes, sir. So now I would like to invite Dr. Sarita. Dr. Sarita Roy, are you on the line? Yes, sir. Okay, but your video is not visible. Yes. Okay, okay. Now, now let me just a minute. Yes. Dr. Sarita Rai is going to deliver <coughs> his talk. Sorry, her talk. She is yes. joining from Dr. Hari Singh Gaur University, Tagar, Madhya Pradesh. See, what's your title is not uh, given here. So green cements and their hydration. Okay, okay. So Dr. Shaitara has did his, her MSc, PhD from her alma mater, that is Dindal Padhya Gurupur University. She has worked with her uh, Professor N.B. Singh. No, Professor N.B. Singh is not mentor of, uh, probably he is mentor of our university. <laughs> what uh, can, can I correctly say? He is not mentor of the only Dr. Shaitara. He is mentor of Dean Alpatya Gorakhpur University. It's true, sir. Uh, Dr. <laughs> Shaitara has worked with the, A.K. Ganguly at IIT Delhi, uh, Professor N.S. Gajbiye at IIT Kanpur. She has visited uh, foreign countries like Germany. Now she is assistant professor in Department of Chemistry, Dr. Hari Singh Gaur University, Shagar. So without uh, elapsing so much time, I would like to request Dr. Shatta Rai to kindly deliver 
is last invited talk of the today's not uh, her last talk but uh, the last this, uh, invited talk in today's morning session of the international conference on futuristic materials so dr saitara please share your screen first open your powerpoint presentation then share and start your talk dr saitara Okay, thank you very much, sir. I am very much thankful to the organizing committee who has given me this opportunity to present my work over here. A very good afternoon to all of you. I will discuss about green cements and their hydration. If we look at the history of binding materials, there have been continuous and sustained developments in search of new construction materials. Clay, lime, gypsum, and lime pozzolana mixtures were considered as effective and useful binding materials prior to the usage of Portland cement. With a very short period of its discovery, the production of Portland cement enhanced considerably and now its consumption has become one of the major indexes of development of a country. Portland cement clinker was discovered by Joseph Espardin in 1824. When we mixed calcium carbonate, silica, clay, iron oxide, silica in a rotary kiln at 1450 degrees centigrade, the nodules of clinkers are formed. When these nodules of clinkers are grind with gypsum, we get finished cement. During clinkerization, high energy, large amount of calcium oxide, large amount of limestone, and emission of large amount of carbon dioxide is taking place. The mineralogical composition of tricalcium silicate is 73.7%, dicalcium silicate is 65.1%, tricalcium aluminate is 62.3%, and tetracalcium aluminoferrite is 46.2%. This is the medium scale Portland cement plant in India. In cement industry, there is a consumption of huge amount of energy and huge amount of good quality of limestone. The above the harsh the above to emit large amount of CO2 gas. One ton of Portland cement produces one ton of carbon dioxide. Emission of carbon dioxide is responsible for greenhouse gas, and this greenhouse gas is responsible for global warming. Some problem is there. <laughs> Could not share my screen, but I will continue anyhow. Today, carbon dioxide concentration in atmosphere is about 400 ppm and rising at the rate of 2 to 3 ppm every year. About 450 ppm is the critical threshold that must not be crossed to prevent irreversible climate change. The window of opportunity is thus limited to 20 years. One minute, sir, I am trying to that's my harsh beta is screen say yeah is screen yeah essentially there are following ways to reduce is screen yeah is screen kaha raha hai on the screen do my powerpoint beta yeah that one powerpoint 
कैसे कैसे हो गया एसेंशली देर आर फॉलोइंग वेज वेज टू रिड्यूस कार्बन डाइऑक्साइड इमिशन एंड रिड्यूस एनर्जी कंजप्शन फ्रॉम सीमेंट मैनुफैक्ट कंक्रीट इमीडिएटली बट दिस विल नॉट बी एक्सेप्टेबल टू सीमेंट मैनुफैक्चर और डेवलपिंग अदर ऑप्शन आर रिड्यूस द लाइट कंटेंट एंड इंक्रीजिंग द बेलाइट कंटेंट and one of the most important way important way is to replace cement clinker with some low cost materials the economical and ecological problems associated with cement production during the last 50 years have prompted the use of clinker replacement materials what has given birth to a genetic group of cements known as blended cements or composite cements the materials which are used as a blending component are said to be mineral admixtures or supplementary cementitious materials blending components are of two types industrial waste or agricultural waste out of industrial waste gbfs silica fume fly ash and others are known in agricultural waste we are studying rice husk ash sugar cane bagasse ash bamboo leaf etc and are also known the general behavior of blended cement is quite similar to that of portland cement since they harden when mixed with water and form calcium silicates and calcium aluminate hydrate these are the advantages of using industrial and agricultural waste in cement industry consumption of energy will be decreased production cost will be decreased heat of hydration will be decreased workability and ease of pumping will be improved there will be superior microstructure leading to lower permeability long term strength will be higher reduced risk of alkali silica reaction higher electrical resistivity leading to lesser chances of reinforcement corrosion according to DIN EN 1971 there are four classes of blended cement cement 2 cement 3 cement 4 and cement 5 according to american standard testing material c595 there are five classes of blended cements portland blast bird furnace like type is portland pozzolana cement type ip and type p pozzolan modified portland cement slag modified portland cement and slag cement type s these are the typical compositions in fly ash silica is 52% alumina is 23% and so on these are the typical analysis of some natural pozzolana in santorini art silica is 65.1 alumina is 14.5 and these all are present natural pozzolana fly ash silica fume rice husk ash sugar cane bagasse ash bamboo leaf ash are considered as pozzolanic materials gbfs is latent hydraulic materials and limestone is inert filler now pozzolanic materials are high in silica and often also in alumina if silica it reacts with calcium hydroxide to form calcium silicate hydrate at ordinary temperatures when we add water in tricalcium silicate we get calcium silicate hydrate plus portlandite this is the portland cement hydration and when this calcium hydroxide reacts with silica it will give extra amount of calcium silicate hydrate and known as the pozzolanic reaction when we plot a graph between calcium hydroxide content and curing time we have shown that in the presence of portland cement the content of calcium hydroxide is continuously increasing but in the case of portland pozzolan cement the increase of calcium hydroxide up to 7 days and after that it is decreasing it shows that there is the consumption of calcium hydroxide in the pozzolanic reaction this is the model of the cement hydration extra glue is formed additional glue is responsible for more strength in the pozzolanic reaction 
there are two factors which affecting the pozzolanic activity internal and external pozzolanic activation can be done by mechanical chemical and thermal methods we can evaluate the pozzolanic activity by chemical methods physical methods and mechanical methods in chemical methods we are studying estimation of silica and alumina estimation of calcium ions in physical methods electrical conductivity and x ray powder diffraction are studying in mechanical we are studying compressive strength properties of blended cements setting is retarded heat of hydration is reduced pozzolanic reaction is slow that's why early strength develop ultimate strength is very higher durability is increased permeability is reduced and expansion and cracking also reduced this grows expansion in 30% of pozzolan is minimum in compared to portland cement now another supplementary materials is fly ash Fly ash is a finely divided residue that results from the combustion of pulverized coal in electric power generating plants. Most of the fly ash particles are solid spheres and some are hollow sino spheres. Fly ash is primarily silicate glass containing silica, alumina, iron and calcium. The surface area is typically 300 to 500 meter square per kilogram. This is the XRD and same micrograph of fly ash. According to European standards, fly ash may replace 10 to 50 kilogram per cubic meter of concrete, depending on the quality of ash. Ordinary fly ash is not hydrated by itself, but it is hydrated by adding alkalis and calcium hydroxide. Incorporating fly ash in concrete can enhance the properties of concrete. These positive aspects of incorporating fly ash in concrete are generalized. Adding the wrong type of amount of fly ash can be detrimental to concrete. Activation of fly ash can be done by chemical, mechanical, and physicochemical methods. When sodium sulfate is added, it reacts with calcium hydroxide, first giving sodium hydroxide, which increases the pH of the solution, accelerates the dissolution of fly ashes, and it speeds up the pozzolanic reaction between calcium hydroxide and the fly ashes. At the same time, the introduction of sodium sulfate increases. At the same time, introduction of sodium sulfate increases the concentration of sulfate ion and results in the formation of more itrinzite. Form itrinzite, which contribute to early strength. Dr. Sarita, please conclude within two minutes. Okay, sir. Okay. This is the complete strength uh, versus curing gas graphs. In this, we can see that in the presence of alkali, strength is higher. This is, we studied fly ash, animal bone powder. In the presence of fly ash, animal bone powder, we, are, we can say that rate of heat evolution is lower in the case of OPC, fly ash, animal bone. The strength is higher due to dense structure of the matrix. This is the same micrographs in the presence of OPC, fly ash, animal bone powder. The table, this table shows in the presence of OPC, fly ash, animal bone powder, the expansion is minimum 12.4, and it's higher in the case of OPC and OPC FA, OPC AB. From the fundamental point of view, adding silica fume, it is giving more gel. This more gel is responsible for higher strength. 
lower permeability and lower capillary porosity. This is reduced the size. Lower permeability is responsible for superior durability and adding silica fume to OPC is responsible for carbon CH reduced. This is the AFM of OPC, AFM of silica fume, and AFM micrographs of cement paste section after six months of hydration. These are the effects when we're using slag in cement and concrete. We can get better concrete work. Lighter color, lower cost, more consistent plastic and hardened properties. The hydraulic activity of slags depend on the glass content, its chemical composition, mineralogical composition, fineness, and activation of slag glasses by chemical or thermal means. The rate of heat evolution of GBFS in increased with the increase of sodium hydroxide concentration. Dr. Sharda, may I request you to conclude? It has been deported. Hello. Activity increased by increasing temperature and pressure ratio. This we can get the amount of hydration by nanocarbonate composites in compact tension. So. Dr. Shetta. It is advisable to use the table as well and create amounts till the placement of Portland cement to reduce the energy consumption and raw materials in order to lower the cost of cement production, improve the quality of cement, and protect the environment. That is, minimize waste and decrease the Okay, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Dr. Sharta, for giving such a nice lecture, starting from basic to the <clears throat> to your research work. There is some connectivity issue, but uh, it is all part of <clears throat> online lecture. So now, are you hearing me, Dr. Manoj? Yes, sir. Now it's uh, network is okay, sir. Okay, okay. <clears throat> Dr. Manoj K. Gupta is now going to deliver the last invited talk of today's today's morning session. So I would like to invite Dr. Manoj Gupta from Bhopal to kindly deliver the invited talk on piezoelectric oxide nanostructures based flexible nano generators so let us let us start thank you sir um, respected um, head of department physics department uh, professor ravi shankar singh faculty members of gorakhpur university physics department my friends very good morning to all of you Sorry, there was just some uh, delay in some technical issue was there. So without delay, let us start. So thank you for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to present some of my recent research work in this uh, forum, conference, basically. So today I'm going to talk something about piezoelectric nano generator based for flexible electronics and how these nano generators are capable to harvest mechanical energy. So practically I'm working in the CSIR MPRI as a scientist and uh, the institute is located in the Bhopal in the uh, city center basically. So in this talk, I will introduce about the piezoelectricity, the concept of nano generator. Then I will discuss about the oxide based piezoelectric material and their application for nano generator application and then flexible hybrid composite nano generator. And if time will permit, I will also speak something about the hybrid electric nano generators. So basically we all know that energy is required for the society for all human beings. 
and there are two type of the energy basically non renewable energy and renewable energy and non renewable energy is basically coming from the coal nuclear oil and natural gases and we all know that there is a limited uh, sources are available in our earth so we have to look forward for some other alternative source so for that we have biomass waves solar cell water geothermal and other things but we need to find out some other new renewable sources like smart and portable renewable energy devices our own devices that can generate electricity so in this way uh, piezoelectric materials is a very smart material and it generate electricity when you apply the mechanical stress or vice versa if you apply the electric voltage then mechanic then the crystal will oscillate and it generate ultrasonic waves that we used for ultrasonic wave generation so here what i will do i will utilize the direct piezoelectric effect means we will apply some mechanical pressure and then we will see whether the device is able to generate electricity or not so particularly there are two very beautiful example of piezoelectric materials one is the very uh, common material like sio2 quartz and then zinc oxide and various other perovskite materials are also available that are used for equitator sensors applications like in zinc oxide material because of the relative displacement of the zinc cation with respect to the oxygen and and i it generate electric dipoles along c axis that is responsible for piezoelectric behavior now so uh, whether all materials are piezoelectric or not so we know ki all crystal structure can be classified into the 32 symmetry point group and in this 32 symmetry point group there are two groups non centrosymmetric and centrosymmetric so this non centrosymmetric material possesses the piezoelectric effect and then there are further subgroups are there ferroelectric materials piezoelectric materials that are used for memory um, devices applications so without talking the beautiful property of the nano material we cannot complete our talk so we all know ki nano materials has very fascinating properties like high surface to volume ratio quantum confinement effect because of the variation of density of a state versus energy you can see when the uh, morphology changes the behavior of the dos versus energy change so it gives a lot of uh, beautiful properties in various for various application i will not go in that detail so what is the nano generator so nano generator is a basically a technology that convert mechanical or thermal energy into electricity in 2006 professor jongli wang in the usa what he did he grown the vertical aligned zinc oxide nano wires on the conducting substrate and then he measured the atomic force microscopy of a single nano wires and he observed that given there is short key contact when it there is a contact between the fmt and the nano wires then it generate electricity because of the piezo potential so utilizing the same concept we have developed in our institute various kind of the piezoelectric nano generator using the nano technology and piezoelectric concept we all know ki in our daily life we have a plenty of mechanical energy like even in our human body there is a blood flow It, is, it we have kinetic energy in the form of blood flow breathing typing walking even sound wave is a, a mechanical energy we can convert these sound waves into the electricity means you just talk and you can charge your mobile phone by this technology so what is the difference between the classical batteries and nano generator so we know ki battery is having a uh, output power but we need to uh, charge it or it, it is having a very limited lifetime just few month or few week whereas in the piezoelectricity once you are having the mechanical energy kinetic energy you can generate electricity like a, a, a example i will show you like for pacemaker so every pacemaker has a battery and every 2 years or 3 years the patient has to go for the another surgery to replace the battery if we have a, some kind of the bio implantable devices that can power the pacemaker just by the blood flow there is no need to go for the surgery application and if we can power this pacemaker through nano generators this is the one of the beautiful example you can see for large 
large scale harvesting applications if you connect the piezoelectric materials and combine them in a series series are uh, parallel wise and then while the rolling of the cars over the piezoelectric materials it can generate electricity that can store in the capacitor that can be further utilized to power the various electronic gadgets okay so uh, in this way it has various application in the all sectors let us come on the our result basically so what we did actually we grown this zinc oxide nano wires on the alumina substrate and then uh, we utilize the gold electrode as a top electrode to make them a short key contact and then what we did we apply a mechanical pressure over the over the top electrode and you can see this peaks voltage versus time curve it is showing 40 millivolt when we are applying a pressure or releasing the pressure then it is showing the negative pulse in that way it generate 40 millivolt phases but in the zinc oxide is having a semiconducting properties and also the band gap about 3.37 electron volt I means it is having the uv sensitivity so we applied the uv light and then what we observe when we are applying the uv light the electric potential decreases the output voltage was just 10 millivolt because electrons whole pair generated and it screen the charge uh, screen the piezo potential so um, so you can see this is the uh, sem morphology this is a uh, vertical align on the alumina substrate and it is having a very good uniformity as well so because of the oxygen vacancy and the surface defects electrons whole pair generated in the presence of the uv light and it decreases the output potential so what we did we applied the thermal annealing of the materials we passivated the all defects like oxygen vacancy surface defects and uh, then uh, in the even in the presence of the uv light you can see you can see the output voltage was about 200 millivolt and when we releasing the pressure it is showing the negative pulse so a cyclic uh, performance is coming with respect to the time and even in the uv light the the device was showing the stable performance you can see the photoluminescence spectroscopy of the pristine device and the surface passivated device this the uh, near about 2 electron volt this is a defect associated peak after annealing at 200 degree centigrade the intensity got decreases means we control the defects and then the device was stable even in the uv light as well as in the normal atmosphere now since the device was on the hard substrate we can dream for the flexible electronics you can see this video this screen is basically made by the samsung and this is the very flexible but battery part is still hard so we need to come up with the some technology that has flexibility transparency as well as foldability so we took we took this uh, as a challenge and we have developed the flexible two dimensional vanadium doped zinc oxide nano sheet based nano generator why vanadium because our aim is to improve the power efficiency because millivolt is not sufficient to power the leds or lcd or even our mobile phones so we have to improve the power so we took the vanadium because it is a transition element and our aim was to grow the nano wires vertically one dimensional but after vanadium doping our nano structures got converted into the 2d morphology a well connected uh, vertical align nano sheet structure we observed from the spin assisted growth techniques and you can see this is a showing the very flexibility and hr team and even the sad pattern you can see the what very good high crystalline images and 2d like structures so why the nano wires got converted into the 2d morphology after vanadium doping we propose a mechanism since the zinc oxide is a polar molecules and the uh, and after vanadium doping many voh chains have formed and they connected to the positive polar surfaces of the zinc oxide and then because of the shielding effect one dimensions got converted in the two dimensional effect so to ensure our mechanism is correct we have done the x ray photo electron spectroscopy study to see the electronic state of the vanadium within the zinc oxide lattice and we found that there is a v4 plus and v5 plus electronic state were there in the zinc oxide 
and after the eds also the we got the confirmation now as i said our motto was to find the increase the piezoelectric charge coefficient so what we did we measured the piezoelectric charge coefficient through the piezoelectric force microscopy of a single nano sheet it is very challenging task actually so we grown the same nano wire on the platinum substrate and then we took the pfm and you can see it is uh, after applying the voltages it is showing the uh, vibration in the picometer range and then graph suggested that it is having piezoelectric charge coefficient about 4 as well as it shows also the butterfly curves and hysteresis curve we suggest that it may be having the ferroelectric property as well and this kind of the uh, since the ferroelectricity in the zinc oxide is a very uh, i can say is a hot topic some say it defect it comes from the defects and some say is defect it is a intrinsic property after doping it means ki this kind of the devices can also be useful to store the electronic signals now we uh, now utilizing our Uh, morphologies and the nano structures we fabricated the nano generator and then you can see the bottom electrode is the pt substrate and the top electrode is the gold and when we apply a pressure even by our human finger and we have a dynamic shaker that can apply a specific force at a specific frequency then it generate one micro ampere current you can see the red one is the when we are applying a pressure so it generate in current in the range of micro ampere and it is having Excuse me dr gupta yes yes sir please sir conclude within 5 minutes yes sir thank you sir so in this way we are getting the dc kind of the voltage it means no need to uh, go for the rectification circuit directly we can got the dc signal as well you can see this image this video when we touch the device it it generate the electric signal so a real time demonstration we have also done on our devices since time is limited so i will skip it similarly we have also developed we have uh, further improved the output performance of the devices by choosing a, a different material called zinc silicate nano wires and this is a random aligned nano structures and this na- uh, random aligned nano structures we gon- we converted them into the flexible and rollable devices using the graphene so basically first time we have shown that this nano structures are showing the non centrosymmetric property by the xrd but since we need to confirm it with a single nano wire so we done the P- pfm again for one nano wire through the pfm and we got the piezoelectric charge coefficient about 117 picometer per volt very high now then parallelly what we did we grown the graphene nano graphene nano mono layer sheet by the cvd technique in our lab and then we transfer this graphene nano sheet on the plastic substrate you can see the raman spectroscope it is showing very, very good quality 2d peak and this is our device image as you can see the nano nano wires were randomly distributed in the pdms matrix and then uh, with the increase of the output voltage we got up to 6 volt from millivolt to volt that is sufficient to power the leds and even in the bending mode if you put the device in our human finger just by bending we can generate up to the 2 volt and if we talk about the durability ki how much it can work so up to the 1000 cycles there is a uh, good stability we observe from the devices and efficiency is a 29.10% recently um, this paper we got published in the nano energy with very high impact factor 16 okay this is the rollable device now since as i discussed ki we need to see the power efficiency and the nano structures were randomly aligned the polymer matrix so electric dipoles may be randomly aligned we have to align them in a vertical direction so to do so we 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 have developed a device with the nano cube of kind of the morphology with the zinc stannate it is also a piezoelectric material with high polarizations so uh, for this one we done the x ray diffraction scm that part i will not discuss and then we did the simulation 
and we observed that ki at which filler concentration of the zinc stannate our device was uh, is working with high efficiency and we found that ki there is two reason at a low force at a high force the output voltage was very high then what we did we made the device and we put the device on the road and then after the rolling of the vehicle tire we roll the vehicle cars over the devices and uh, we got the output performance up to 12 volt so this is the real demonstration and the work was um, also featured as a cover uh, cover page of advanced functional materials uh, similarly a two dimensional nano disc kind of the morphology we have developed on the itu substrate and and two control experiment we have performed one dimensional morphology and two dimensional morphology without any doping because such kind of the 2d morphology is only obtained by the doping so without doping we have achieved this morphology and it, we have developed conducting carbon nanotube in our lab and then that carbon nanotube we have utilized as a conducting electrode as a top electrode because of the zigzag structure of the cnt it has a very good interfacial with the nano disc if you apply a small pressure the total bond interfacial pressure is effective pressure is high so at the same time we compress many nano disc and then we can generate high electricity and that is up to 20 volt we optimize the condition surface defects we have removed and after control uh, optimization we achieved very high performance this also got published recently in the nano scale advances so since the time is very limited we have a lot of opportunity and play with the materials high d33 high uh, d33 value with high transitions value high polarization we can successfully convert these nano powders into the devices like sodium potassium nitrate Uh, we develop devices with up to 48 voltages and not only the devices performance but how the the science behind it how it uh, affect the affected by the defects electric polarization that we have addressed and parallelly we have also developed the stretchable devices the device you can wear it and to do that we utilize the pvdf polymer as the active piezoelectric electric material and graphene as a top flexible as well as stretchable electrode and carbon nanotube as a bottom electrode so by the lithography technique this study we have done it you can see you can apply anywhere and since it is a pyroelectric thermal gradient thermal fluctuation we can convert them into the electrical energy so we have done two study like when we apply the heat through the graphene side or when we apply heat through the cnt side so by applying the heat through the graphene side the output voltage was high because of the high thermal conductivity of the graphene as compared to cnt and see uh, it is uh, showing good uh, behavior even up to the 4000 cycles and now we applied the thermal gradient by hair dryer as well mechanical pressure together simultaneously so as a hybrid and stretchable kind of the nano generator can be also possible and uh, recently a biocompatible nano generator since for body implantable devices we need a biocompatible kind of the devices so we utilize the chicken egg egg cell membrane as a intrinsic piezoelectric material and we made the layer kind of the structures with the pv pvdf materials by the spin coding technique so i think my time is up so let us conclude it yes dr gupta please yes sir so just by this video i am going to um, thanks sir. you can see this is the devices how we can image uh, make our imagination and by the blood flow even we can apply the pressure since it is a nano structure it is very sensitive even a even in a small nano um, newton forces can create in energy so i think thank you sir thank uh, okay this is this is how led grown by applying the pressure thank you dr gupta thank you sir thank you so very much sir now now i would like to invite uh, 
co-chair of this session, uh, Professor R.K. Tiwari, sir, to present a formal vote of thanks to our speakers. So, Dr. Rakesh. Thank you, uh, Dr. Ambris. I, okay. uh, I must want to thank uh, Professor An uh, Anjan Kumar Gupta from IIT Kanpur and Professor Sadia Amin, JNU, and now she is working in Republic of Korea, and Dr. Manoj Kumar Gupta, Professor P.K. Singh, uh, YSU Greater Noida, and Dr. Sarita Singh for uh, his uh, kind presence. Thank you again, sir. Thank you, sir. So, uh, I would now like to thank our uh, <coughs> chair and co-chair, Professor R.S. Singh, sir, and Professor R.K. Tiwari, sir. Uh, the session is uh, coming to its end, but uh, due to lack of time, I have to continue the session. And uh, there is very special talk in this session from uh, Dr. R. Kautekar from Dissolved System Biopia. So to chair this special session, I would like to invite uh, Professor Neeraj Mishra, sir, from University of Lucknow, who has been my uh, PhD thesis advisor as well. So I would request Professor Neeraj Mishra, sir, to conduct this session. Professor Mishra, sir. Yes. Am I, am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Ambrish. I'm really thankful to Professor S. N. Tiwari, Dean Faculty of Science, DDU, University of Gorakhpur, and also to Professor Shantanu Rastogi, who have invited me to chair this special uh, session on Biovia. Uh, in this uh, special session, I welcome you all, and we shall see the details of a powerful simulation software combined with data mining and analytics. And before introducing and inviting Dr. Ritwik, just my two cents on this particular topic, very special topic of computational material science. The main goal of the material science is the design of new materials and the development of new and efficient methods for the controlling and optimization of the material properties like mechanical, chemical, electrical, magnetic, thermal, acoustical, optical, and many others by the manipulation of their composition and structures. It involves advanced experimental and analytical investigations of the combined mechanical and physical chemical characteristics of the materials under various thermodynamic conditions and external excitations. This field has become very consistent in the last 15 odd years and has got into a mature investigation instrument in the material investigation called computational material science, popularly known as CMS. CMS is a branch of material sciences that uses theoretical concepts and models from chemistry, physics, geology, mineralogy, as well as biology, <clears throat> and includes them into software applications in order to calculate the structure and properties of molecules, gases, liquids, and condensed matter. The computer simulations get additional information despite those obtained experimentally and can predict and still answer some undiscovered phenomena. The numerical simulations can offer experimentally unavailable information such as the electron density or the electronic charge. Simulations are useful in suggesting new kinds of experiments and data analysis as a result of an experiment replacing costly equipment, team of scientists, materials, and time consumption. Or it can also be dangerous, such as explosions, drugs, and pesticides, or contaminating experiments. Nowadays, with the support of high performance computing resources, the CMS plays an important role in all the aspects of material science, especially in the dynamic domains such as surface science, nanoscience, electronics, biology, and drug design. It establishes a direct relationship between structures and properties, delivering theoretical solutions that may guide us to synthesize new advanced materials with new properties. And in the recent years, it has become increasingly obvious that the key to getting that edge in computational research uh, is computer research. Problems that used to take ages to solve can now be solved within reasonable amount of time using the computational resources. And there is a lot to explore. Now, let me formally introduce Dr. Ritvik Kavatekar. Ritvik Kavatekar is a senior field application scientist at the Source Systems Biovia, India. He has worked as a research scientist with Momentum Performance Materials, formerly GE Advanced Materials, 
He's a computational material scientist by training and has broad interests in interface chemistry, catalysis in excited states, electrochemistry, and polymer chemistry. Tools of interest include multi-scale modeling, classical molecular dynamics, and property pred predictions. Quantum chemistry methods like QSAR, DFT, and many body perturbation theory are of interest in the context solar cell development. Statistical tools for analysis and developments are of immense value in bringing through screening of molecules. BioVR tools provide a single platform for data mining and analytics, coupled with powerful simulation software, enable rapid development and prototyping of chemical products. Now things like Material Studio, Electronic Lab Notebook, Ecosystem and Pipeline Pilot project products are areas of interest and which are all included in this BioVR package. So I will not take much of your time and shall request Dr. Ritwik to deliver his talk. Dr. Ritwik, please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, sir, uh, Professor Amir Krishna. Thank you very much for this kind uh, uh, introduction. Um, I hope you are able to see my screen and uh, yeah. I'm audible to you. Yes, it is. We are. Uh, I would like to thank the organizers uh, for letting me speak uh, for this uh, session. And uh, without much ado, we will kick off our presentation. Right. So uh, if you have any questions uh, with regard to the software uh, or any questions on uh, computer simulations in general, you can email me. My email address is uh, given at the end of this uh, slide. Okay. So this is RKR10. Right? It's not O. It is RKR10 at the rate 3ds.com. Right? So... Uh, just a quick introduction on the Dassault system. So Dassault Systems is the same company which you see in the news. Uh, that is the Dassault Aviation Company. Uh, so we are a separate sister concern of Dassault Aviation, um, uh, which manufactures the Rafael aircraft. Right? So under the Dassault Systems umbrella, we have many brands and one of them is BioVia. So formerly we were called as uh, Axelries. Some of you might know the name Axel Rees. Um, when it comes to a research platform, it is not just about uh, molecular modeling, which we cater to. We also have software solutions for electronic lab mode. Given the importance of uh, today's uh, conference talk, where uh, predominantly most of the uh, presenters are from experimental background, I thought uh, this should be an intro, uh, important slide, which uh, we should discuss about. Electronic lab notebooks and their advantages uh, will come up in the next slide. Uh, we also bundle it with something called as chemical inventory management solution, which helps you keeping, uh, helps you in keeping track of all your uh, chemicals or instruments or uh, supplies in general, right? Uh, Material Studio, which we will see um, what it is today. Um, it is mostly on atomistic molecular modeling for materials. We have another software uh, which does computer-aided drug discovery, CAD solution. Uh, this is the sister product of Material Studio. It is called Discovery Studio. And uh, it does ligand profiling, um, QSAR activity search, uh, ligand design, structure-based design for your ligands, right? And uh, Pipeline Pilot Collection is an automated library. It's an automated uh, solution by which you can write simplistic visual programming codes. Uh, it's typically built for um, people who are not familiar with programming, right? So quickly uh, touching upon the importance of electronic lab notebook in today's uh, research arena, um, you have students that typically leave after PhD and it is very difficult to get hold of their data unless you have their hard disk and even then it is difficult time in assigning the sample IDs uh, to sample spectra and the state of the sample in which the spectra was taken. So you need a, a tool which can store all this data. It can be molecular modeling, reaction search, uh, reaction chemistries. 
uh, reporting literatures and so on and so forth there is an excellent uh, webinar uh, given by carolins ka institute uh, it's one of the premier institutes that use the biovia electronic lab notebook they have been a very old customer of ours and they have thousands of licenses um, for eln and they have migrated now to the cloud platform so if you go to uh, sciencecloud.com uh, you should get more information on what science cloud is and what the electronic notebook has to offer to academia you can also use biovia draw uh, it comes with the eln software uh, the group leader has audit control on it so whenever the experiment is documented the student clicks a submit button and it is reviewed by a senior student uh, in the group or it can be reviewed by the group leader directly so there is an audit mechanism by which your electronic labs uh, are actually data is actually captured and then translated or transferred to you right so you have the experiments uh, at hand all the time and you can simply search through all of these documents whenever you want you can all you require is basically an internet connection and uh, it runs from a typical browser right you can run it from a typical browser uh, so what does material studio have to offer uh, material studio does quantum and classical calculations we will see what are the advantages of this eventually these uh, models uh, can then be transferred to engineering softwares like abacus uh, which the soil system also sells right so what do we have here in material studio uh, you have a fantastic 3d visualizer by which you can sketch any kind of molecules it can be polymers uh, crystals it can be electrodes uh, it can be surfaces or inter for interfacial materials and nanostructures and so on and so forth right now we give you a host of uh, solvers from both quantum and classical mechanics uh, typically you will have uh, all the dft solvers available to you including qmmm solvers the classical mechanics solvers are typically foresight and gulp uh, there was an amazing presentation uh, Uh, previously uh, by professor manoj and uh, gulp is one of our uh, classical mechanics calculators that can calculate piezoelectric constants and i thought this should be an interesting time to demonstrate this now mesoscale modeling is one step above atomistic modeling what we call as coarse grain modeling and uh, we also have a small informatics suite which helps you in building genetic and neural models uh, for fitting purposes right so we have a structure activity relationship uh, software built into it now apart from that we also have uh, reaction engineering chemistry solvers so for more details please get in touch with me and i will be happy to take you through all of these uh, what can material science uh, offer you right now is uh, what the uh, illustrious uh, members of the panel committee and uh, the presenters have been um, describing uh, to the audience uh, in the past uh, two days and uh, computational material science allows you to predict a lot of analytical chemistry data from physics and chemistry related analysis right so you can do band gap engineering uh, from a physics perspective do infrared spectra or uv spectra for chemists nmr analysis again chemists require that reaction kinetics and thermodynamics predict predictions for both the periodic and non periodic structures so it fulfills the needs of both physicists and chemists uh, for chemists it can be reaction and reaction engineering and kinetics for physicists it can be more on the analytic side uh, like electron hole uh, propagation electron transport mechanisms phonon spectroscopy and so on and so forth right we can also do electron loss spectroscopy in the form of xps or what we call as score hole spectroscopy right you can also induct include magnetism 
for both the correlated and non-correlated systems. Use uh, dispersion correction calculations and get to your area of expertise within a matter of hours, so to speak. Right? So the uh, starting point is basically trying to build your molecule. It can be a molecule, it can be a cl cluster, it can be a surface, or it can be a, a surface that is specially prepared for a calculation like say viscosity. Right? So you can do mechanical property predictions and also include virtual reactions as well. So when it comes to nanostructure builder, we have uh, some nice uh, tools which you can build ropes, clusters, and nanotubes. Uh, one example is uh, shown to you in this slide. People who are interested in looking at transport phenomena, we have solvers like uh, tight binding DFT, which you can use. So this is an example on the left-hand side. Um, where you can see a defect zigzag uh, graphene nano ribbon and uh, the corresponding uh, uh, electron localization functions can also be plotted for these solvers. On the right hand side, you see a more elaborate quantum calculation, uh, which is coming from a package called Demol Cube within Material Studio. This is the package which you typically use to do an all electron calculation. Right? So you can look at the orbitals that are contributing to electrical conductivity or optical states. Uh, when it comes to pre-processing uh, or prepping the model, prepping the uh, system for your use, it can be, uh, as I was uh, seeing today about disensitized solar cells, which there is a nice example uh, on curcumin we will discuss. It can be zeolites uh, from a catalysis perspective. Uh, it can be heterogeneous catalysis. Uh, uh, you can prepare the system and uh, you can also do some solvation chemistry as you can see on the left hand side. So all these uh, model preparation does not take you more than 15 to 20 minutes to set up and you can start your calculation at the click of few buttons. Right. So here you can see uh, uh, a gas phase spectra of uh, trinitrotoluene, um, a TNT, uh, which is given in the form of a graph. Uh, I hope you are able to see my screen and see the corresponding peaks as well. Uh, the method that is used here is uh, TDDFT, time dependent density function theory, in order to get to so called oscillator strength. So if you see these uh, sticks, these are the oscillations or these are the uh, optical absorption uh, wavelength um, positions. Right? And uh, around this uh, wavelength positions, you can see a spectra that is fitted. Okay. Um, on, the right, on the bottom of the screen, you can also see some infrared spectra of aspirin. Uh, you can map out the important uh, uh, absorptions. Uh, the best part about optical and infrared spectra is that uh, they can be verified by experiments. More or less, almost all the systems are typically will show accurate uh, absorptivity calculations in Demol Cube. So you can also do NMR uh, calculations if you have a crystalline solid and uh, we will discuss on how to model crystalline solids uh, along with a gas phase or solvation chemistry calculations uh, at a click of a few buttons uh, you can um, predict the isotropic or anisotropic shifts arising from a nmr calculation uh, the solver that is used here is called the CASTEP DFT program. This CASTEP program is a plane wave DFT program, uh, which typically a lot of uh, physics people like to use. Right? And uh, you can also uh, plot uh, these uh, uh, shifts uh, with respect to the uh, calibration uh, material you are going to use. So depending on what you want to do, you can have different kinds of calibrating materials. Uh, if you're looking at metals, zeolites typically, 
uh, or even um, a simple <coughs> uh, uh, drug molecules in crystalline form. Right? So one of the popular applications of material studio is uh, pharmaceutical material solids, wherein we try to uh, predict a lot of analytical spectra and polymorph uh, characteristics. We also predict the polymorphs which can exist uh, for these particular drug molecules. Right? So let's start with the crystal tools that are present in uh, Material Studio. What are the capabilities? Let's say you have an NMR structure of a molecule and you want to find the ultimate crystal structure. The best way to do it is uh, look at the single crystal data, uh, put it in a diffractometer, and compare it with a database, right? And uh, try to solve it um, from the uh, diffractometer itself, right? But uh, single crystals are typically hard to find. Uh, They're very difficult to achieve experimentally, uh, difficult to crystallize it in a particular form which the um, uh, diffractometer can make use of. Uh, and uh, more or less, they are sometimes unstable. So the easiest way to do is uh, look at the powder pattern. right? And uh, in order to solve the powder pattern, you need to do something called as a refinement method. So it can be retwile, poly, uh, or it can be a program like Excel. So Material Studio has a, a Reflex Powder Sol module. So Reflex is a module which does a lot of crystallography um, data analysis. One of them is called Powder Sol. So with the help of Powder Sol, you can actually solve the powder pattern from your um, machine. So if you are uh, if you have access to the raw file, it can be directly imported. If not, a simple X Y um, chart also is possible. You can import that X Y chart and start analyzing your X ray. Now, if you are looking at polymorphs, uh, so all you need is the uh, 2D or 3D structure of your molecule. So the NMR result structure of your drug molecule you can feed it into something called as polymorph predictor. Now, when you put it into a polymorph predictor, it will give you a number of polymorphs, uh, and then you can drill down to the polymorph of interest by simulating the XRD pattern or looking at analytical chemistry fingerprints from these structures. So basically, you generate a lot of trial structures, you refine these trial structures, and eventually end up with the crystal structure of your choice. Once you have the unit cell, you can also look at this uh, uh, wolf construction of the crystal. Meaning what? If I put uh, this pigment red under a microscope, I should see crystals that look something like this. So there are extensive uh, publications using Material Studio for predicting the morphology of a given crystal. Now, it can be a dye molecule. Uh, or it can be a drug molecule. So drug molecules have affinity towards uh, uh, some FDA compliance, uh, which they have to follow. And uh, pigment molecules, which are in the important in the uh, dye industry, uh, are required to predict these morphological structures because their intensity and other reaction chemistry uh, depend on the morphology of the crystal. Okay. So how do you go about it? Um, you can either start from an existing template. It can be a 2D or 3D structure, or it can be a unit cell. Right? So you optimize the geometry for this. You predict the morphology, and you end up with a nice diagram like this. If you have new crystals with no prior structural information, you can import them. You can do the indexing and refinement of this particular solution and get to the crystal structure. Now. Moving on uh, to polymers, uh, the capability that is uh, presented in Material Studio with respect to virtual reaction chemistries. Let's take an example of epoxy polymers. Um, and uh, let's say you want to develop hardener molecules, or you want to look at uh, plasticizer molecules, or you want to look at whole conducting materials for permeation studies or whatnot. Right? So this is an exercise in polymer development for which a particular target property has been identified. So it can be a permeation property, uh, 
uh, or it can be a property uh, where you are doing an ionic conductivity uh, in the in the browser i saw something called as uh, uh, what was that super ionic conductors right or uh, super ionic solids so basically ionic conductors or membranes um, uh, which may be liquid or glassy in material right there might be glassy states so all you need is input to your molecules define the atoms which are going to participate in the reaction pack them into a nice box and then create a network so this network creation goes through certain steps uh, you look at uh, creation of new bonds depending on distance parameters then you perturb the structure uh remove any ring spearing so that um, you don't end up uh, cross linking with a ring which is not supposed to be um, you know pierced so basically you will not have a bond uh, that will cross into the ring right that's what it means then you can increment the distance and do molecular dynamics at the same time so every time a molecular dynamics uh, step is done it looks for the bonds that are created right if they are close enough and uh, if they are close enough then we apply a spring potential so basically the same spring potential which a typical uh, reaction would have okay if a reaction was uh, being modeled through quantum chemistry what it would do is apply a kind of uh, spring potential and then slowly the bond would form this is the vibrational Uh, state of that particular molecule in which the transition state is formed right so similarly we try to mimic that in the classical sense so this is not a quantum calculation we do it classically right and now how do we do that uh, i'm going to skip this example from boeing on how they use material studio to come up in the come up and design uh, epoxy materials if you have questions you can write to me so i'm going to uh, quickly play a video i hope uh, yeah so i'm going to do a quick video i hope you can see it okay this is how you create the polymer network right so you can have as many materials you want and these materials uh, are going to be put into a box by defining the uh, atoms that need to be reacted okay use pack these oligomer molecules in a box and um, then start the reaction this is basically a, a equilibrium molecular dynamics calculation and uh, where what you see here are the fragments growing so this is the curing process uh, which you are virtually simulating so as you can see uh, the molecules start to grow and the color of the system changes depend on depending on the network size right so next example is from catalysis uh, so how do you do catalysis so people who are interested in interfacial Uh, reactions uh, how do you go about uh, uh, doing these calculations right so you can oops i lost my point okay so here you have an interfacial material so this is a cleaved surface of a given crystal so example t out to water platinum on hydrogen this is a zeolite uh, a zeolite framework uh, looking at uh, uh, butanol synthesis mtb synthesis so how do you do that is uh, you select the molecular surface for docking uh, you can dock your reactants on top of it we have some nice programs that help you in deciding where to dock the molecule you look at hot spots uh, which are the low energy structures for docking once you optimize them you calculate the thermodynamic uh, quantities uh, then you look at the energy barriers or reaction rates so these reaction rates are typically given to you by a transition state calculation and 
that is the basic process to identify an optimum catalyst right so this can be a, a molecule or it can be a target for which the um, property predicted is either uv spectra or piezoelectric constants or any constant the workflow is more or less very similar right so i'm going to skip the slide uh, this is an example of high throughput screening uh, uh, for um, hydrogen fuel cell uh, materials uh, it can be the separator or it can be the electrode uh, what you are trying to basically look for uh, in developing such materials is say for example permeation uh, for the given membrane or look at uh, orr uh, reducing uh, materials right so how do you how do you do high throughput screening so first of all you need a virtual materials library this is a database from which the calculations uh, can be pulled right so you need you need structures to do the calculations so you need to find a way of screening these calculations right now and this is uh, the screening in a typical scenario is going to be synthesis and characterization right now the questions arise once you start to do 1 2 and 3 what is the basis on which uh, what is the basis with which you can create or enumerate these molecules uh, you need some kind of a logic right so this logic uh, can be established uh, using um, molecular modeling and then look at an automated workflow by which you can narrow down on the property so for example uh, in catalysis this would be d band center of a given uh, uh, catalyst right then you can have activation energy uh, or you can have adsorption energy if you want to uh, look at uh, homogeneous catalysis how are you going to do that right so one of the solvers uh, which we have is called one tap one tap allows you to do a uh, thousand atom above uh, level of dft calculations and uh, typically runs on um, huge clusters right so there are people who work in collaboration uh, in order to do such calculations because uh, clusters high performance clusters are not simply available with every university now what they did was uh, they did an stm <clears throat> to understand the nanoparticle dimensions and uh, they constructed this nanoparticle uh, in silico okay, using uh, software construction tools and then they put it in the program called wonder right so what they found basically is that with varying geometry uh, the active sites uh, with the required energetics can vary right so you can see that uh, the experimental dots are is this curve here okay this experimental curve is here and the diameter of the nanoparticle is uh, optimum somewhere in this range right so the number of sites do not increase if you have a nanoparticle size more than four nanometers so what does that mean when i synthesize this my nanoparticle size has to be around 3.5 to 4 nanometers given that scenario what is the shape of the nanoparticle okay so if you have cube octahedron truncated octahedron or quasi spherical then the activity uh, or the fraction of the sites that are available for uh, oxygen reduction reactions are going to vary with a trend like this right uh, this is an amazing calculation uh, which was uh, done with the company that makes catalysis catalyst that supplies catalysts right now if you are looking at electron transport properties um, typically used in uh, developing the next generation battery materials um, you can use tight binding dft which is quite fast and uh, which is quite easy to perform as well uh, sir uh, please let me know when i have to stop uh, my presentation and um, uh, i will i will make sure to truncate it Right. Dr. Rithik, please uh, conclude within five minutes. Okay, sir. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, 
this is an example in disensitized solar cells uh, now what you see here is a gas phase calculation of curcumin dye and uh, what you are seeing here basically are the orbitals which are uh, taking place in the excitation so you can see the calculated optical spectra uh, looks something like this right and uh, when you when you um, calculate the optical spectra you can look at the orbitals uh, that are responsible for these particular excitations so for example we are looking at uh, something 500 nanometers uh, and uh, 520 nanometers which are the two intense peaks in the visible region where you can harvest a lot of energy uh, not accounting for the 400 or uv um, uh, uv spectra so you can see that the uh, highest occupied molecular orbital is localized in the bottom half of uh, curcumin this is uh, pretty much a symmetric molecule right so if you there's a plane of symmetry here i, I wouldn't say they are mirror images but definitely uh, they look quite symmetric so when you excite them you see that the 500 nanometer one is actually latching on to the upper part of the structure more uh, than any other spectra right so at 522 it is completely delocalized on the upper part of the spectra is going to uh, the pi orbital so this is a pi pi transition but if you want to visualize it this is how it looks like right so now what are the what happens when i put it onto a semiconductor right so the example here is the anatase uh, 101 surface we have modeled anatase 101 surface minimize their interaction with curcumin and if you look at the homo here it is totally localized on the dye molecule and if you look at the unoccupied molecules unoccupied orbitals uh, they are typically localized or spread over all the uh, d orbitals on titanium right so this is a visual proof of excitation where you can also modulate the kind of uh, binding affinity you want towards the uh, semiconductor surface right so uh, with uh, these uh, thoughts uh, i would like to uh, leave the presentation and if there are any questions uh, if, if the moderator is allowing me to take questions or else uh, i rest my case so the next half of my presentation was an example on how to design lithium uh, battery materials, but uh, maybe we can uh, share with you all these interesting things uh, later on. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you for, for, for this invitation. So now I would like to invite uh, our head of department, Professor Shantanu Rastogi, sir, to thank the speaker and our chairperson of this session. Yes, uh, it's our pleasure to have uh, such interesting uh, talks today. I would uh, especially like to thank Professor Neeraj Mishra for accepting to chair this session. Uh, although it would have been good if it was offline and he would have visited Gorakhpur. But uh, uh, I also thank the uh, speaker uh, of this special session, uh, Ritwik from Biovia. And uh, I am sure that we have gained insight into the software and what are the possibilities that can be explored through it. Uh, we will meet again for the session, uh, next session in the afternoon. And I thank all the participants once again. Uh, Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. I am uh, can give any announcement if there is any. Yes, sir. The next session will start uh, after a short break of 15 minutes and the link will be the same as provided. Thank you. Thank you all.